And now we come to the portion of our service where we ask the Holy Spirit to show up. So let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we pray that you'd show up. That you'd be known here this morning. Once again, I am reminded of the scripture where Paul had a thorn in his side. We don't really know what it was. But over and over, he begged you to take this pain from him. And your response was that your power is perfected in weakness. So there are times when, when we have things in our lives that we would rather that you would remove and you choose not to sometimes. And so when, we're <clears throat> when we don't feel like we're at our best, you can be. And so, Lord, if there's anything that we're grappling with, anything that we're holding on to, we pray, Lord, that we would just be able to drop that at the foot of the cross and hold to you exclusively. That we would have open hearts and minds to hear what we would hear if Jesus were teaching this morning. Do that work. Make the word come alive to us. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Neil Gaiman is a prolific British author. He, he writes in various genres. He writes books for kids. He writes books for adults. One of his more adult books is called American Gods. And it tells the story of what happens to the old gods when they follow their worshipers across the Atlantic and end up in the quote-unquote new world and then are promptly forgotten. But they're stuck on American soil, not their native land. His characters are the embodiments of thoughts and devotions that are given in worship or extended attention. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because there is an idea in our culture today that many people view devotion itself as something that we do to make ourselves feel better, whether or not there is actually someone on the other end receiving our prayers. Today, as we look at the text, we're going to be in the book of Galatians. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Galatians, we'll be in chapter 4. This is on page 1813 in your pew Bible. We'll be looking at verses 8 through 11. Galatians chapter 4, verse 8 to start, page 1813. Let's just focus on verses 8 and 9 to start. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? So what we're looking at this morning is God's nature versus our nurture. And there are two truths that we should hear. And here's the first one. God's nature is sovereign and singular. God's nature is sovereign and singular. Verse 8 says, formerly when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not God's. So everything rises and falls on what is the actual nature of God. So we're going to jump around in Scripture, and I, I think I wrote in the uh, sermon notes some of the references. You can go look them up, um, verify what I've been talking about. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10 says this, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed nor will there be one after me. And in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, 
This is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and the last. Apart from me, there is no God. Yahweh, the Lord, the creator of all. He is the one who made every other variation of the denizens of heaven. Cherubim, seraphim, angels, the host of heaven. The thing to remember is there is none like God. He is at the top of the mountain and there is no one else there. The Lord was there before the mountain was. The Lord spoke and poof, mountain. There is no one like him. He is the first and the last, the I am. Now, people used to live in slavery to false gods, ideas that deserved their devotion. Some of these false gods, little g gods, had specific names. Baal, Asherah, um, Dagon, Ra. Some of these false gods and ideas are concepts that are found in our century. Media, fame, power, money, influence. They are still little g-gods. False ideas that absorb the devotion that rightly belongs to the Lord God, El Elyon, Yahweh, the Most High. Verse 9 asks this question. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, look at the separation of those two. The implication that Paul is making here is if you knew God, if you really knew God, Paul says to the Galatians, you wouldn't be falling backwards. So let's just say that you're known by God and ask the question, how is it that you're turning back to weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? That's the question that Paul asks the Galatians. Now, Scripture says elsewhere in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We are intended to walk with God in freedom. I want to walk with God, like the kids sang today. It's probably one of the reasons why it hit me so hard is because this has been rattling around in my heart and mind all week long. And yet, people choose slavery to sin. Then and now. Consider that in Isaiah chapter 40 through 45, the prophet shows in detail how God defends his sovereign and singular nature. Take some time this afternoon. Read those six chapters. And I know, it's like, you're giving me homework? Yes, I'm giving you homework. <laughs> Read Isaiah 40 through 45. And look at how God describes himself. There are other spiritual beings, but there's none like Yahweh. The Lord God is unique. The Lord is unique, and because this is true, those of us who have come to follow him are warned to cling to new life in him and to turn away from our old dead ways of being. God is sovereign. God is in control. And there is no one like him. As we continue to look at Paul's words to the Galatians, we're going to pick this up at verse 10 and just look at the next two verses this morning. Verse 10, you are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. As we think about God's nature versus our nurture, the second truth that Paul points out is this. We are slaves to a system. We are slaves to a system. Now, why would Paul have a problem with the Galatians observing special days and weeks and months and years? To answer that, we have to make sure that we understand the context of the book itself. I talked a little bit about this last week. Galatia is a Roman colony. It's part of a grand empire, and this in this empire that stretches across the known world at the time, there is not one god that oversees Rome. There's a pantheon, there's a whole group of little g-gods. 
that are in the Roman Empire, to which people who live in that time have given their faith and devotion. They're not all Roman gods either, because there are different ethnic groups inside the Roman Empire. They bring their own understanding of deity and worship to Galatia. And so you have some groups who worship one god or another. There are temples and places of worship all over. This is a very syncretic, cosmopolitan, melting pot, everybody does their own thing that's right in their eyes society. Does that seem familiar to anyone? <laughs> we live in that same kind of society right now. And so the warnings that Paul gives to the Galatians would well be learned by us in our time. Separated by 2,000 years, here's the truth of it, human nature does not change all that much. We are slaves to a system also. We're slaves to a system that's our default. Now, God's nature is singular and sovereign. We are slaves. We like our systems. And there are indicators here in the text of a dead system. Paul points out right up front that, are, that their tendency to pay attention to special days and months and seasons and years as the people living in this polyglot of multiculturalism in America, uh, excuse me, Galatia. We, I was hoping you guys would get that. Thank you. We see that there are all kinds of beliefs vying for our attention. When people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ start paying extra attention to special days and weeks and months and years in order to conclude that if you adhere to this tradition, then therefore you must be doing it right. That's not what Christian freedom is all about. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We are to be following Jesus, not following a system, even if the system is about Jesus. That's why Jesus came. The Pharisees had the people of Israel so wrapped up in their Pharisaical ways that they couldn't understand what the kingdom of God was really about. We humans, we, we look for systems to which we can attach ourselves. And the indicators of these dead systems are that people get caught up in the calendar. They're wrapped up in controversies, arguing over old traditions and ceremonies. Let me remind you, from last week, God is not impressed by that. We heard this from our Old Testament reading today in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me? Says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Paul writes to the Galatians, I fear for you that I have somehow wasted my efforts on you, that the Galatians have carefully considered what freedom in Christ is to be, that each one of us has a personal responsibility to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and to run with endurance the race that is marked out before us. Instead, do we look at the life that Jesus extends and conclude, nah, that's just too much work. It's just easier to come up with a list of do's and don'ts and to say that this is the way we've always done it and so this is the way we're always going to do it forever and ever, amen. No. No, that's not what God calls us to do. Consider this from Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 2. Son of man, say to the king of Tyre, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In the pride of your heart, you say... I am a God, I sit on a throne of a God in the heart of the seas, but you're a man and not a God. Though you think you are as wise as a God, this, this is a warning that we can hold our own wisdom instead of clinging to what seems to be the foolishness of God. It will not go well for us if we cling to old rules of tradition just for tradition's sake. Now, I understand that we are studying an ancient book. One might conclude that just by doing so, we're clinging to an old tradition just because it's old. I don't think that's what we're trying to do. Here's how I see it. 
When we study together, we learn what ancient times were like. We learn what the situations were that people found themselves in then, and we look carefully at the solutions that they come up with, the ways in which they interacted with God in order to deal with a specific situation at a specific time. Now, what can happen is that modern people can look back at those solutions, those ancient solutions for that specific time and think that doing the solution itself is the answer. No. The solution is the means by which people connect to Yahweh, the Lord God Most High, the first and the last, the ever-living one. He is the answer. Amen? He is the answer. The solution just lets us connect to him. And that's why it's so important for us to read and understand and comprehend and deal with and tear apart and try and put back together the lessons that are taught in Scripture. Because it's not about us replicating exactly what the Bible says. It's about learning the same lessons that the people in the Bible learned and figuring out how can I take this method of connecting to Jesus, which is the answer, and is there some way I can implement these lessons in my own life, in this time, here and now? Andre Crouch sang, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. Now, he wrote that as a part of the Jesus People Music Revolution. 1968, 69, 70, somewhere around there. But here's the truth of it. Jesus is the answer for the world today, for the world yesterday, for the world to come. Jesus is the answer, period. You see, when humans place emphasis on what humans want instead of what God calls us to do, walking in fellowship with him. It's a waste of our time. Consider this also from Isaiah chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the cause of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. They, though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Notice the phrase, let us reason, in verse 18. God doesn't demand blind obedience without thought. The Lord wants to reason with us, to convince our minds and hearts that his way is the best way, and the best way is Yahweh. God wants people to love him with all of their heart and mind and soul and strength. Remember? Remember the praise that the Bereans received in Acts chapter 17? They received the word with eagerness when Paul came to preach to them. And then they went home and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what he was saying was really true. <coughs> this is a mark of noble character the willingness to carefully examine the teaching which we hear. And I ask you to do the same thing. Don't just sit here and just take everything I say and like, oh, I'm sure he's done the studying. I'm sure it's fine. Check me. And here's the thing. I know I've got a congregation full of a bunch of really smart people. And you're gonna. And there are times when I have had people come to you, uh, you know, when you said this, that wasn't quite right. And I've, I've had to preach a retraction the next week. I'm willing to do that. If you catch me on some part where I've deviated, bring me back in. That's what we, as followers of Christ, are to do for each other. As iron sharpens iron, so does one person sharpen another. How can we practically determine what is authentic teaching about the nature of God and what is false teaching, revealing fallen earthly desires of humanity. Ask yourself, who benefits? Who benefits if you hear of a teacher who's hawking their own wares, trying to get you to buy their books and their records and subscribe to their broadcasts and podcasts? Who receives benefit from that? They do. Contrast that with who benefits if the kingdom of God is being built with what is right and what is just. When that is elevated, the oppressed find relief. 
The fatherless and the widow are looked after. And the scarlet sins of our souls are washed in the sacrifice of Jesus and made as white as snow. Any comparison that tries to elevate humanity to some godlike state or some divinish powers to claim that we've got those things, that we can speak things into being by naming and claiming and declaring and decreeing, be warned. God is God alone. He is the first and the last, the alpha, the omega, the creator of all and the conqueror of death. Anyone who claims differently is selling something. Let's pray. You are El Elyon, God Most High. That title, Lord, doesn't even make any sense if we don't realize that it's designed to compare you to every other little G God that tries to vie for your attention. One of my favorite songs is called The Finish Line. And it talks about how there are a hundred little gods on a gilded wheel and that they vie to take your place. And by your grace, Father, I will never kneel. And yet we get caught up in the world and we give way more attention to power and influence and money and fame as opposed to keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus the author and perfecter, finisher of our faith. That's a Lord for the times that we get wrapped up in our own stuff. Please forgive us. Help us to throw off every weight and the sin which so easily entangles and run with endurance the race that you have set before us. And if there's anyone hearing this sermon who has not yet made that decision to throw off that weight and to fix their eyes on Jesus and run home, hear this invitation. Jesus loves you right where you are. The book of Romans chapter 5, verse 8, this is how God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, while we're still stuck in our old mud, Christ died for us. And says, accept me now, and I will make you clean. Don't have to worry about cleaning yourself up before you come. Just come. The whole reason why he does that is because that's his nature. There is no one like Jesus. There is no one like God. So come home and discover this for yourself. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.